Volvo Ocean Race and Headquarters, we've got a very full show to bring you. We're going to be talking to plenty of the sailors. We're going to be hearing about everything that's been happening out on the racetrack. Plus, at the end of the show, we're going to be getting your questions answered live by our race expert team. We've got Will Harris here working away. His job is to bring you all the race information. And if you've got any burning questions, anything that you see in the show that you want answered, send it in at the end of the show. We'll try and answer those for you. Plus, tomorrow, we are going to be teeing up what has been an absolutely phenomenal battle. Dong Fong Race Team and Mafray, we're going to connect those two skippers together live on the show to hear what they've got to say. If you've got questions for them, put them down in the comments below. And we're going to start today with some very good news indeed for fans of Team Brunel. Annie Lush yesterday out of a bunk, now back on deck. It's really nice to be out on deck, just there. Uh... Partly, you know, below doesn't smell that good anymore, so <laughs> it's quite nice to be out in the fresh air, even if it's pretty cold. Um, yeah, to be honest, I'm out here because it's pretty light. It's only 13, 14 knots. Um, I did ask the doctor to, this morning what he thought if I came on deck this afternoon, and he said I'd probably be better off making tea and coffee, so, yeah. I can't really do that much still, which is frustrating. I don't think I'm really helping the guys much, but... It's nice to be out here, at least. Great news for fans of Annie Lush to see her back on her feet and on the mend. Now, let's take a look at what's been happening out on the racetrack. This is how the race is unfolding at the moment on leg three with the finish line all the way to Melbourne. The key theme here, staying in the breeze to the south. It's the Dutch boat, Axe and Abel, who are struggling right now at the back. They risk falling off the breeze and watching the boat in front of them turn the tide on plastic, sail clear away. Then we've got Sun Hunkai Scallywag, and then the battle for third. Team Brunel and Vestas 11th Hour Racing. It's Dong Fong Race Team in second place who are watching Mafre charge away in the lead all the time, holding on to that incredible breeze as we get ever closer to seeing the conclusion of this leg. Now, if you were watching the quick fix this morning, or indeed if you were glued to the tracker, you will know that there was an unbelievable jiving battle between those two boats. Dong Fong race team clawing away, trying to get back into the race, but Mafre answering every single move they made. Just take a little look at this. This was the jiving battle in numbers, and watch the progress that the Spanish boat made. Mafray certainly showing the French Chinese team just how it's done. If you've got any questions for those two boats, remember, we will be talking to them tomorrow. Put your questions in the comments below. But to explain a little bit about the jibing process, this is Tom Clout on board Sun Hung Kai Scallywag, giving us an insight into exactly what's required. It's about a 20 minute process. You've got to do all your internal stack. Every every item that can be moved is moved. Uh, and then set up for the jive, all your sheets and sails getting ready, going deploying. Uh, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that's yacht racing, I guess. Maybe I get a maybe I get a sleep next watch, off watch. It's jibing, but in nice conditions. What if you've been out on leg three in the Southern Ocean for days on end and you are running seriously low on reserves of energy? Well, this clip came in this morning. This is from our onboard reporter with Dong Fong Race Team. We haven't touched it. We are showing you exactly how it came to us. Well, and just take a look yourselves. Uh, 
Bakımdan takip edebiliriz mi Hazırcay'dan? Bakımdan takip edebiliriz. see the fatigue on the sailors' faces there. And now, if you've got any questions about anything that you've seen there from that clip, who indeed you think is going to win this leg? Because right now, it is very close to call. You can put any of your questions in the comments below. And at the end of this show, we'll be doing our best to give you the answers that you need. Now then, coming up next, we have been speaking to a boat that have got their own personal struggle. Axe and Abel, with damage to their mast, was forced to slam the brakes on and watch the rest of the fleet sail past. And we caught up with Chris Nicholson to hear just how big that challenge is at the back. It's essentially now the leaders are, you know, so far in front of us, they're constantly in different wind and different breeze angles. So, uh, and they're in more breeze. And even Turn the Tide and Scallywag continue to be in more breeze than us. Um, so for the immediate and mid-term future, they're gonna keep putting miles on us. So um, it's hard, it's hard yards, I've got to say. You know, conditions are nice and calm and easy, but um, we'd probably prefer exactly the opposite to try and um, try and work our way to them but uh, we're gonna as I said we're gonna have to take our medicine now for for a few days and hopefully we hopefully there's an opportunity towards the end to catch up um, but you know to be honest I'd just much rather always be in their position than ours and I wish we could talk about things more positive but obviously you're facing a bit of a hard reality with the amount of time that you've got to get the boat back up to full speed in Melbourne Yes, um, yeah, we obviously, you know, the, the much documented problems that we've had with the, um, with the mast, um, although we think that'll, that'll come under control quite easily in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, we've got a, we've got a, a, f a few issues with the boat, uh, but nothing, nothing major, nothing that'll stop us being completely competitive on the start line. Um, now it's a little bit more about um, trying to give, the, give everybody enough rest or equal rest 
um, to our competitors. Uh, you know, one scenario has, you know, maybe some of the boats getting in two, three days in front of us, um, so they get that much more rest and that much more focus on the next leg than what we do. So um, we've got to try and maybe put a few plans in place to make sure we're 100% ready for the start on the second in Melbourne. Times like this, it's a little bit hard to find any get up and go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, surprisingly it's better than than what I thought it would be. Um, you know, the, the one thing about it is you've got to you've got to be absolutely 100% honest in regards to one that you really don't like the situation you're in, but then you know just what what you're going to do about it individually and as a group to to get better for the next one. So that's. You know, there's still so much more race to go. If we let, you know, if you let things like this get you down each time, you're going to end up with a miserable race the whole way and, and bad results. So we have to, we really have to bounce back and, and, and have a plan to get better. We have to make sure that we're 100% ready for the next leg and try and fit the rest in around that. I don't think it'll be the other way around where we where we have a holiday and then worry about our leg prep. That's not going to be the case. Tough times for Axe and Abel, but what a difference a few miles make. Just a little way ahead, turn the tide on plastic in a very different mood indeed. We caught up with Elegy Jane Matru to get the lowdown on what they were doing and caught them right in the middle of a manoeuvre. Actually, we have some uh, clouds behind us and a bit more pressure coming in. So we're moving the sails back to put more weight at the back of the boat and make the bow uh, staying out of the waves in the front. And like this, the boat can keep accelerating and not like hitting every every wave. And so uh, it's to, 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 to you play the game to not be a submarine, but to just uh, surf on the waves and and like this we'll be able to keep the speed up a bit more. I'm guessing it's a, a welcome relief to be doing an interview rather than lifting all those incredibly heavy sails yet again <laughs> as you push on ever onwards. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm quite lucky that I'm talking to you when they are moving the stack around me. <laughs> uh, so we have um, on watch, we have uh, Frederico, Melo, Bianca Cook, Liz Wardley. And we have also Nicole Linvan and Dick Afari that are giving us a hand at the moment. They're out of the cave for one hour. They take a bit of the sun. And down below, we have Martin and Lucas that are getting prepared to, to come on deck. We've got Christmas Day coming up. What's your guess at the ETA at the moment for the finish line? Uh, I think from what I've heard, from our, we, we still should be on, at sea for five or six days. Uh, we're not really counting the hours till the end, like I think it's better, it's still a bit far away, you know, it's more when you uh, you go under the 1,000 miles and the two, three days to, to the finish that you're getting focused on to when you will arrive. Most of the people on board are really expecting that we will arrive during the day, like this they can have really good food and beers. And will be open for us when we arrive. I think that's what we're really looking for. It's not really about arriving that day or that day, but more uh, arriving during the day to have a nice party when we arrive. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We'll let you get back to the racing. Good luck. Thank you. LED Jane Matru on board Turn the Tide on Plastic giving us a little bit of an update, but now it is your chance to get your questions answered. We've got Will Harris, solo offshore sailor, part of the race expert team. Now, I've got my laptop here. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming in. You can keep them coming and I will desperately try and get there. But first of all, one of the big questions that we always get asked here is, what is it you guys do? So basically what we have here is we have a lot of data coming in. Um, every 10 seconds we get through the Inmarsat satellites on board the, on board the boat. We get um, all the data, all the loads information, uh, exactly how fast they're going and how they're actually performing. And what we can do, we can analyze that with all the tools, and all the na na navigation software we have on board. Uh, fair, uh, fair, fair to say that you've kind of got two-pronged attack. One, keep people safe, but also at the same time stop people from cheating. Exactly, exactly. We've got to make sure that the, everyone's playing by the rules and playing fairly, but at the same time, 
sailing in such extreme conditions, such difficult places, you're always going to have problems. And we basically manage those problems from here. OK, now I'm going to hit you uh, with some of the questions that we've got sent in. Uh, some of these are nice. Some of these are a little bit mean to sort of put you on the spot. I'm going to go straight in. Keith Smith sent this one in. Uh, why are the... <laughs> you're not going to like this. Why are the Kiwis the greatest sailors in the world? <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, that's sort of something that's each an indi individual person's opinion. Um, I mean, at the moment, we're seeing Matt Frey at the front of the, front of the fleet, and they're really proving that could be the Spanish who are the best in the world. Um, they do have uh, Kiwi Blair Chuk on board, um, so he could have added a slight little bonus, which is why they got a bit more speed, but uh, I don't know. It's for each person's opinion in that case. Well, you know, Keith Smith didn't say where he was from, but I, I bet we can guess. Uh, <laughs> no, right, next question. Okay, so uh, Rex Ellicott, um, who edits the footage off the boat, and how often does it stream into the race centre? So what we have uh, every 24 hour period, the, uh, the OBRs on board, onboard reporters, they'll send in their small edits, which they take, they take all the best shots that they can. Um, and they send about two to three minutes of footage a day and about eight to 10 photos. And that's all sent back here and it's sent directly raw all over the social media feeds. That's exactly how we paint the picture of the Volvo Ocean Race as best as possible. Okay, we've got another question here from Heidi Schumann, who asks uh, what happened to Annie on board Team Brunel and how is the navigator on board uh, Scallywag? But I'll just give you a quick update. If you're watching the head of the show, you might have seen that uh, Annie's up and about. She got knocked over by a wave and just basically landed on the wrong spot uh, with Antonio Fonte. Uh, Antonio Fonte's on board Sununke Scallywag. He basically just went for a little bit of a tumble, twisted his arm. Both of them are on the mend and okay, but this is kind of the pitfalls. Um, right, I want to hit you with this one. This is a quick one. Um, I'm really going to apologise ahead of time for pronouncing all these names wrong, but Dirk Verstratien, possibly correct. Uh, what's the temperature out there? Well, at the moment, we've seen the sea temperatures drop as, as low as five degrees in this lake, which, in terms of water temperature, that's very cold and uh, it's really difficult to sail in. Um, constantly, water coming over the deck is, makes it really difficult. Um, same time, air temperatures down at about eight or nine degrees. So at night, that's really tough, and the sailors have to make sure they're really careful with their clothing, keeping it all dry and making sure they... Uh, they keep changing clothes if they do get wet. Yeah, a little bit different from what we're experiencing here in Alicante. OK, next one. Uh, Kahik Ferreira, I believe that might be right. Uh, what about the wind, sort of looking ahead? Yeah, so we're coming towards the end of this leg, and um, it's really close at the front still. We're seeing lots of different battles across the fleet. Um, have a look behind us. We've got a 600-mile gap almost between the first and last place, which means there's very different winds across the fleet. Um, and it's quite an in-depth subject to talk about, so... Um, I'll be happy to answer that on our Race Experts account on Twitter, at Race Experts. Uh, nice plug, nice plug. More, more depth thing in, uh, for the weather. OK, uh, we've, uh, we had Susie Austin ask, what was, do we think the biggest challenge for the sailors will be over the next 24 hours? Go to the Race Experts feed. They will keep you up to date with all the challenges as they sort of roll in with a lot more of a learned opinion than we have here I in think, the studio. I think one thing on that, though, is the um, last 24 hours of a leg and they've been sailing in really tough southern ocean conditions. We've seen so many pictures coming off the boat that everyone's absolutely exhausted at the moment and just making sure they're keeping to push the boat as 100% the whole way to the finish. Yeah. This is where it really makes a difference. OK, uh, Heidi Schumann, how is it that Mafre did almost three times the jibes and are so far ahead? Well, so what they've done, basically, is in those, that jibing period, they were trying to stay in the maximum wind, which is furthest to the south and closest to the ice gate. And they've managed to achieve that by doing much more jibes than Dong Feng. So although they lose speed each time they do a jibe, They've made sure that they've stayed in better pressure, so when they're sailing in a straight line, they are actually going faster than Dong Feng, and that's how they managed to, to make a small gains on them. OK. Uh, Jean-Luc Romand, uh, apologies for pronunciation, at the last report at 1,300, Dong Feng is 30 miles behind Mafre and sailing with less speed, uh, sort of 5.5 knots. How do you explain this? So what's been going on at the moment, <laughs> I think uh, we've seen, we saw they had a massive jiving battle last night, Dong Feng and Mafre. And I think Dong Feng have really struggled in these jibes, especially mm. at night. And, uh, and I think the crew is very tired on board. So they might just be slightly wavering in concentration at the moment, um, which is causing them uh, to lose slight, small bits of speed to Matt Frey all the time. And it's really costing them as we get to these final, final few days of the leg. OK, uh, so we've got another one coming in here. We, oh, OK, this is a, a very good question. So Ron Martin Jr. asks, will Axel Nobel be able to repair the main track back to 100% in Melbourne. Now, if you were watching the show earlier, we got Chris Nicholson on board. He was saying that they were feeling like they were up to sort of 100% speed-wise, but what do we expect them to do by the time they get to Melbourne? Yeah, this is quite an interesting one because mm. with uh, Melbourne being such a short stopover and with the rules that not, not much is allowed to be taken on and off the boat, um, 
they're going to have to figure out their best plan of attack. Um, we don't expect them in until the 28th of December. So they've got four days to try and repair the marsh track as best as possible and make their way to Hong Kong, where they'll have a longer stopover and more time to actually repair the boat. Uh, this, is, this one's uh, just come in. This is, this is one of my favourites here. Uh, Daniel True Jr. has asked, if it's hot in Melbourne, why are they cold? Simple answer, it's called geography. We'll go on. Derek Lane asked, who do you think will win this leg and why? You guys hate these questions. I love them. Uh, and what size sails are they using in these conditions? So first of all, who's your pick? Well, I mean, I'd say this is a difficult one to, uh, to answer. <laughs> you know, we're, we're the one getting all the data and we're, uh, we we're not, shouldn't really have a bias to either boat, but um, my favourite's always been the, the French for me. Um, I've seen them training the last few months and uh, they look to be a really strong fleet, st strong boat, and uh, we've also seen Matfred really pushing hard. Um, and it'd also be interesting to see Turn the Tide on Plastic and uh, a few guys at the back to try and make their way up to the podium spots at some point over the, the next uh, eight months. Okay, and uh, as an answer to the sales question, I mean, there's a lot of information on your race experts feed. There's also a lot of information on the Volvo Ocean Race website detailing the sales that came from uh, North. In fact, if you go back uh, on, the, on the Daily Live, we did actually speak to uh, Kenny Reid, the president of North Sales. He gave us a little bit of insight on that. They've got a full wardrobe and it constantly changes. We actually spent a lot of time trying to guess what it is that they're using. All right, moving on, um, a very good question here. Kent Nason asks, the sailors' hands must take a beating. <laughs> what do they do to keep going? Yeah, I mean, the hands is the worst problem um, on board the boats, especially on these long uh, Southern Ocean legs. Your, bet, your hands are cold the whole time and they're wet the whole time. So any cuts that you get on them, they, it's impossible for them to heal. So what they do is they've got some really big gloves, really waterproof gloves or wetsuit gloves, and they basically try and keep them on at any moment they're on the deck um, to keep their hands from protection and also keeping them warm. Um, but you see some incredible photos coming off the boats of completely white hands and wrinkled because they've been in the water for so long. Um, everyone's going to have issues with their hands as soon as they get to, the, to Melbourne, um, and they'll be trying to repair them as as best as possible. And a lot of the photos that we've had coming in, I mean, if you go to the Volvo Ocean Race website, uh, or if you, indeed if you've got the app and you click on racing and you click on raw content, you'll see some of the pictures coming in and it's unbelievable. Every day there's somebody else with, with hands shredded. Okay, um, a couple more questions then. We're, we're sort of running out of time, but just quickly, I'll just fill you in on, on a few of them. Somebody's asked here, Captain Joey has asked, um, uh, how did Peter Burling fare in the slamming that her Annie Lush? Um, pretty well, basically. Annie Lush was unlucky on, in, on that incident. Uh, another question here, this one's uh, for you, Will. Um, is there a data cap? This is from Rex Ellicott. Is there a data cap that each boat is allowed per day, or is it totally open-ended? Well, in terms of uh, weather routing and, and weather files, so the boats are allowed to download a total of five gigabytes throughout the whole race. Now, in weather terms, that's quite a lot of weather files um, to download, and I doubt, doubt for them to go over that limit. Um, in terms of media and images, um, there's not really a limit that, that comes in, um, but we try not to send them constantly. It's, it's more the time that it takes to send such big video files from the boats that's, uh, that's the more, more of the challenge. Okay, uh, I think final question really, because I, you won't believe this, but Will actually has a job to do. Uh, okay, Mijon Zawan, I believe. A, a question for you guys here in race control. How do you guys hold on 24 seven in race control? Surely it's exhausting too. Well, I mean, it's all about balancing, um, balancing your energy levels and making sure you've got a really good watch system in place. Um, we're, I mean, it's nothing like being in the Southern Ocean. Um, <laughs> we're sat here in warm, sunny in Alicante, so uh, it's not too bad. But um, at the same time, being here on a uh, 24-7 watch system, we're here at night for eight hours at a time. Um, it's just important to make sure you, you stay out of the office, stay in the sun, and actually get some sleep in between. But we're all experienced sailors, so we, we understand uh, not having much sleep occasionally. And there's a, there's a cupboard somewhere in race headquarters. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, but there's a cupboard in here. It's full of chocolate. Um, there's one more question here. We don't really have time to give it a full answer, but uh, Michelle Pincanelli and Steve Johnson have asked about how do they make the drones fly on board. We, we're trying to give you a little bit more information about that. We've got a reporter on every single boat. They have a drone, and it's taken an awful lot of practice getting the drone in the air, flying it around the boat, and then getting it back to land. We will bring you more information about that because, to be fair, sometimes it's a little bit of a mystery to us how it is that they get those shots. Uh, Will, thank you very much for all your time. Um, you. Will's going to basically go back now to bringing you guys the race 24-7 uh, on the Race Experts Twitter feed that you can sign up to if you haven't done so already. That is everything that we've got uh, today. We are going to be back tomorrow. We've got a quick fix in the morning. Then we've got a very big, important daily live show. We are going to be talking to Mafre 
and Dongfeng race team at the same time, hooking them together. If you have got some questions for the sailors on board either one of those boats, send them in, put them in the comments, and then join us tomorrow while we get those two teams to square off against each other online, just as they're doing on the race course. We'll see you tomorrow, 1300 UTC.